Okay, I thought it was working. All right, I'm just gonna have to use the speaker from the computer. Sure, that, I think me? that's fine. Okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, we hear you fine. Thank you. Okay, sorry about that. Should have troubleshooted my speaker system ahead of time. No problem. Thanks everyone. Thanks for joining us to, um, to our Turn the Tide panel today. We're gonna get started in just one minute. See a few more people trickling in. Just one more minute before we get started. Thank you so much for joining us. Okay, Moppy, should we go ahead and get started? We're two minutes after the hour and we wanna be respectful of everyone's time. Thank you so much for being here um, at our Turn the Tide uh, panel talk on equality versus equity. Um, this is a topic that many of us are passionate about. I know I am um, being raised uh, as a biracial um, girl by a single mom. Um, I found a, a lot of equity in education. Um, so this talk is something I'm really passionate about and I sort of take that experience and I, I take it into my teaching as an educator um, and then in my personal life. So I'm really excited to um, introduce you to our panelists. Um, they're each gonna introduce themselves and they'll give us a little bit of um, background about what brings them to the table, what interests them, um, what is their, uh, their own um, draw towards um, this, this talk on e equality versus equity. Frank, do you wanna kick us off? <clears throat> Excuse me, sure thing, and good morning to everybody. Um, I think somewhat similar to what Holly has shared, um, I've been the proud beneficiary of equity initiatives throughout my life. Um, and now as a early educator, I see equity issues very prominent um, as we look at preschool education um, and some of the challenges that families face in navigating their journey in education. Um, and so as a teacher educator, I always want to bring that to the forefront of young professionals so that they can keep those issues in mind as they are supporting young students uh, so that we can reap the benefits as a society. Thank you. Thanks, Frank. Hi, I'm Rachel Orlansky. I'm sitting in my backyard and the sprinklers behind me just went off, so I apologize if there's major background noise, but I'm the Director of Student Affairs here at Ashford and I've been at Ashford for a little over three years. Um, my professional career really in its entirety has centered around advancing equity and access for a range of populations, generally marginalized, underrepresented, um, from teaching kiddos with learning disabilities to starting pre-orientation retreats for historically marginalized populations to disability services in higher education. It's really my personal and professional um, passion. And so I'm really excited to join the conversation today.
Hi, everyone. This is Min Zhen, Associate Director in the Center for Enhancement of First Year Experience. I have been a full-timer in higher ed for 13 years. I joined Ashford in 2013. Prior to that, I was in a traditional Research One university. So with my limited experiences in job searching and crafting job descriptions, I have read a few equal employment opportunity statements. For example, here I'll just read it out. Employment is based solely on a person's merit and qualifications directly related to professional competence. The institution does not discriminate against any employee or applicant because of race, color, religion, gender, sexual orientation, gender identity and expression, national origin, disability, age, veteran status, marital status, or any other basis protected by law. So many times the statement is previewed in a template. So I thank you for this great opportunity to have a meaningful discussion on social equity. I was born and raised in a culture that is very different from what I experienced in this country. I came here for my PhD degree and there are many historical contexts that I'm still not fully aware of with regard to social equity in the United States. So I really appreciate the safe environment and your openness to different voices. Thanks. Thanks, Ningzen. Bonita? Uh, yes, hi, everyone. Uh, can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Um, I am uh, Benita Daimley Ross. I work for the Center of Excellence in Teaching and Learning. I've been with Ashford for about four years. And prior to coming to the university, I uh, worked for several other institutions, UCLA, USC, and taught at University of Phoenix and graduated from University of Phoenix. And so I was able to see a lot of unbalanced educational struggles because of the type of education that I came from in high school. So um, I did see inequalities in terms of the type of courses that I took and what I was able to uh, comprehend when I got to my first college, which was Cal State Long Beach. Um, I struggled a lot in college because I didn't have the same preparation that a lot of my other student um, friends that I came to know had. So, it's my passion to always um, see equal opportunity and um, equal opportunity doesn't always come that clear in the educational system or where you work, um, depending on uh, what your background is. So I really enjoy you know, being a part of a panel like this because it gives me that opportunity to grow and to learn and to educate myself consistently um, throughout my career journey. Thank you so much for sharing, Bonita, and all of you. I'm really looking forward to us diving into these questions. Um, but just a reminder, everyone, the chat is open. So if you have any specific questions, you're welcome to put them there. Um, and if you are inspired, please do join us in our small group discussion right after this one. We will have a, a four or five minute break so we can uh, uh, use the facilities and get a drink of water. Um, but the small group discussions are, are also really wonderful. Um, so, but let's go ahead and dive in. Um, so let's first talk about the difference between equity and equality. How do they relate? Um, I'd love to start with you, Frank. What are your thoughts on this? Thanks. Um, I love the graphic that we had um, at the start of this webinar series that shows individuals who are treating equally and we see the consequence of what they can see as a result of being treated equally versus the, the graphic that shows individuals who are given the necessary supports for them to have the same experience as everybody else. Um, and, and so I, I love that graphic and I use it in my classes as well as I speak to my students about <clears throat> trying to create learning spaces 
where everybody gets what they need. Um, not everybody gets the same thing, uh, which can be very controversial, especially in early childhood. Uh, many of the teachers that I work with, they say, well, why should uh, Juanita get this when another student doesn't get that? And I said, well, because she needs it um, and it's different and her needs are very different. Um, and thinking back to my own upbringing and my educational journey, I have seen how those instances where I have been given what I've needed versus what everybody else should get um, has made a huge impact. So in kindergarten, surprisingly, my class was a pilot program in our district for bilingual education. So growing up um, in a suburb of Los Angeles, our school was probably 75 to 85% um, Hispanic. And I remember class would be conducted in English on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. And then on Tuesdays and Thursdays, it would be all in Spanish. And so for the Julias of the world who was in my class, Tuesdays and Thursdays were great because she completely understood all the content that was being taught. And even the Cindy McDonald's of the world, uh, she was in my class too. I saw the benefits that it made for an individual who grew up monolingual English speaker to be able to add on an additional communication form and content and all the cultural pieces that we learned about as well. And for someone like myself, so both of my parents are from Mexico and immigrated um, in their early adult life. Born here myself, um, as all of my siblings were, I have two older sisters and they were taught Spanish growing up. And as is typical, they struggled when they got to school because they had that language gap and, and barrier. And so when I grew up, my mom said, okay, he's gonna learn English. So growing up and going to school, I was kind of that middle person of having one foot in one world of the American culture and English and another foot in my Hispanic culture. And I would ask my mom, you know, how do you say this the way Abuelita says it? Because I, I didn't have that fluency in Spanish. And so, you know, even as a kindergartner, I remember seeing those differences of how an educational decision that emphasized equity, how that decision translated into the learning experience for the Hispanic students who came from a Spanish speaking background, as well as the um, students who came from a monolingual English speaking background and how together we were able to kind of join forces and create a beautiful um, school environment where everybody could succeed and demonstrate their competence. Fast forward a few years later, um, so by this time my mom had started her education here in the United States and was working in the school district. And then my family made the decision, again, I see it as an equity decision to put me in the private Catholic school of our community because the rigor was higher at that institution than at the public elementary school. So here I am being given another opportunity that meets my specific educational needs. Um, you know, and challenged me with the appropriate rigor. So I completed my education in elementary school. And then when it came to high school, we were looking at two particular schools. One, uh, which was the one that I was initially interested in, had an interesting um, kind of skill uh, labor type of emphasis that after you completed your high school, you would actually earn your associate's degree in a trade. And I thought, hey, that's pretty cool. You know, I could learn about computers or something like that. And then the second one was a traditional college prep high school. 
And I remember distinctly, my mother said, you're not gonna go to the trade school. And I argued with her. I'm like, my friends are going there. I wanna learn about computers and technology and blah, blah, blah. She's like, no, you're gonna go to the college prep school. And I was devastated and I hated my freshman year because I didn't know anybody there. And this was 30 miles away from my house. And so I had to ride the bus to get there and ride the bus to get back. But I completed my education there and again, had a higher level of rigor and was pushed into AP classes and honors classes. And I was very, very fortunate to come away with an outstanding education, which opened doors for me into my college years. Um, and, and again, even then, it was that push for my family. Uh, you know, as all juniors and seniors, you come up with the list of your preferred colleges and you have your safety schools and the ones that you are reaching for. And I remember when colleges were on campus at my school and they said, okay, you know, who wants to go here? The Stanford people. And, you know, my hand went up and everyone's looking at me like, what are you thinking? Why, why are you going to go listen to Stanford? And even my guidance counselor said, you know, well, okay, you can go, but let's make sure that we have some other schools on the list so that you can get into. Um, and again, this was in the 90s. And so we had affirmative action in California. And more than likely that had something to do with my admittance, admission to Stanford. But not that I wasn't a, a good student, I had a 3.8 GPA and I was in college cla honors classes and AP classes. But again, whether it had anything to do with it or not, that emphasis for providing additional rigor, providing an opportunity that may not have come to pass had that legislation not existed or, or other factors in there um, has created a trajectory, at least for me, um, whose father never completed third grade to now have continued my education and built that trust and built that sense of self that I can succeed um, and to be sitting here with you as someone who has earned their doctorate degree is now teaching other teachers how to pay that forward uh, to the next generation. Um, and so each of these kind of little snippets that I share with you are instances where I see people have chosen equity versus choosing equality where I have been given what I've needed specifically to be able to reach my full potential um, and not be complacent with getting what everybody else gets because we're trying to be fair um, in some abstract concept. Um, so again, you know, it's kind of near and dear to my heart um, and just kind of wanted to be able to share as I see the difference between that equity and equality um, you have individuals who have very specific needs and when we can give them what they need and tailor that to their development, we can see a lot of people thrive and grow um, and a lot of wonderful things come out of it. Thanks. Thank you so much, Frank. Rachel, I saw you nodding a lot. Would you like to add to this? I love your story, Frank, and it um, speaks to me from the disability services perspective because that's what we talk about around equitable opportunities. Um, and I'm going to touch on that piece later, but I thought for this um, time together, when I think about equity versus equality and what's the difference in those definitions, I've been thinking a lot about um, the situation that we're all in right now, right? All being affected by this COVID pandemic. We're all at home. We're, we've all been interrupted, disrupted. Life events have been canceled, postponed. Schools have closed, libraries have closed, our synagogues have closed. We're all being impacted. And on that level, it's equal, right? You could say that this is an equalizer. We are all being impacted by a pandemic. That's the equal part. 
But when you think about our different situations, right? So right now I told you I'm sitting in my backyard and that's because my two kiddos are inside on Zoom. We're on three different Zooms and that's only possible because I bought this ridiculously expensive Wi-Fi booster that showed up at my door because I have the means to do that. And we are in our separate areas because that's really important and we have the ability to do that. I'm sitting in my backyard. I have a backyard for the kiddos to plan during recess. I can put food on our table. They have a mommy with a master's in education. They have all the supports that they need at home, right? So we are being impacted. We are all grieving losses right now. We're all really facing trauma around this. And yet the way that we're being impacted has a lot to do with the privileges that we walked into the situation with, right? I think about family members. I think about friends. I think about our students. I, my team um, works on our helpline, right? Every single day we get a referral for a student who is being impacted would be an understatement by this pandemic, right? They used to do their schoolwork at the library, but the library is closed. They used to do their schoolwork at their job where the internet was better, but their office has been closed. They're having to choose between working their job and childcare, and there's no right decision there, right? <clears throat> if you're watching this panel right now, you have a job, right? And we've all had the privilege of being able to work from home. And that is such a privilege right now. So though this has been an impact on all of us, I think when we think about it from an equity perspective, that's where you can see the inequities, right? In the level of disruption, the level of impact. And I really think it's highlighted the discrepancies between the haves and the have nots. And so when you take something that feels equal but you look at the impacts being placed upon folks experiencing it, you see how inequitable that disruption might be. Thank you so much for sharing. Ning Zen, I'd love to um, ask you a question. So, um, and this is maybe something we're all thinking about, what are the benefits to considering this equity versus equality and the benefits to thinking about them separately as unique goals, or should we be thinking about them as a stepping stone from one to another? Thank you, Holly. First of all, Frank and Rachel, I really love your stories. So I decided to put my story aside for now. Um, I have been reflecting on this question over the weekend. If the previous question is more about defining the concepts, then this one is about operationalization. So what I'm going to share is personal without any supportive arguments from literature or anything. I have a colleague and friend at Ashford who once said, Minjen, I believe in fairness. So we had several conversations of fair versus equitable versus equal. I have to admit at this point, I'm still confused as the words are so closely related, but this is my understanding. So we started with inequality, that's pretty clear. Unequal access to opportunity, something's given for granted. Equality, as Frank and Rachel just said, that is being defined as the same or exactly alike. Sometimes it's not needed, other times it's not enough. Equity, custom tools to address inequality. So then let's talk about fairness, because this is interesting. Fair to me means appropriate in circumstances. Have you noticed that? You decide that in a certain scenario, which approach is appropriate to treat everyone the same or to give people different supports they need. For example, at a restaurant, one can get a free dessert on his or her birthday. If I'm there and it's not my birthday, I cannot get a dessert for free, right? It's appropriate for the person getting a free dessert on his or her birthday, and it's appropriate for me to have to pay for mine because it's a normal day for me. This is a standard operating procedure for many restaurants. So it's not like it will actually come as a surprise for me. Fairness lies in the fact that it holds true only for that circumstance and is open to all who have birthdays. 
So now let's think about school experience. I think in today's world, we, it's, it's agreed that people or students are different and treating everyone the same in every situation is not always the best solution. In a classroom setting, students need different instructional strategies and modifications to be successful. It is a reality that must be acknowledged and addressed. And most of the time, when people support the idea of um, providing more visual support to visual learners, providing more language support to second language learners, we're okay with the decisions because people get what they need and we don't need their support to be applied to us to the extent that our own opportunities are sacrificed because of that. Why? Limited resources. For example, what if an instructor is constantly helping a struggling student to pass a class and does not leave much instructive feedback to my assignment that I spent lots of time challenging myself and completing independently? If I receive his or her feedback, I may, I may change from a B student to an A student. Can the instructor also provide support to me because an average student also deserves striving for success? Second, if the instructor later lowers his or her classroom expectations when grading the struggling student's paper, other students may think that everyone needs to be evaluated equally using the same rubrics. So equity is easy to implement in two scenarios. First, to similar groups of people. Both kids, one side of the apple tree is higher than the other side. Have you, have you seen that cartoon picture? Both struggling students, one course requires C minus to pass and others require D minus to pass. In this case, the one on the higher side of the tree, the one enrolled in a class with higher expectations gets the longer ladder or more support. Second, two different groups, but the same expectation. Kids are shorter than adults and are given longer ladders or more boxes to reach the apple trees. Or a class only uses pass or fail without ladder grades, then struggling students get more support. But many times equity is more complicated in a way that struggling kids need support to pass the class and achievers need support to strive for their defined success. Just like adults are on the higher side of the tree and the kids are on the lower side of the apple tree, both need support to reach the tree. In this case, having a selfless character is essential for equity to be successful. And sadly, it's not common. Equity and equality are tangled. One of the benefits that I can think of to separate them is that equity focuses more on providing needed support and accessibility throughout the process or overall experience. And equality is more about merit-based evaluation and professional standards. People, kids or adults, are given custom tools and support to access the opportunity, the apple tree. But who wins the apple picking context is defined by how many apples they pick, which is determined also by support receivers contributed time and effort after the same input. Equity and equality are also stepping stones to each other because equitable access to opportunity and equitable support throughout experience make the equal assessment at the end more meaningful. At the end, I just want to say that equity should be an approach to minimize achievement gap not an excuse at the end of the day to claim that expectations need to be differentiated, altered because they cannot be reached. There are sayings that put equality and equity as opposite sides. It shouldn't be that way. They should be supplementary to each other. Some people claim that equality reinforces the achievement gap by applying the same expectations and norms to unequal people.
or unequal groups. I respectfully disagree. Equal expectations are not the problems. The challenges are how to support unequal groups to achieve those. We give needed support and resources to each individual group to achieve those and empower those groups by recognizing not just the effort provided to them, but also their hard work, their effort, their interest, their culture along the way to achieve equally high outcomes. That's just my opinion. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. And I know you touched on it a little bit, but what challenges to equity in education and or career opportunities exist in your experience or in your observation? Okay, so here comes my story. <laughs> I said I will put it aside for a while. So um, you could probably already see that I came from a culture that highly value equality and personal effort. People are not used to ask for help or support. We are told from very early in our, like when we were little actually, from one generation to another, that we need to work hard and overcome challenges and barriers independently. So we acquire skills and competencies that nobody can take away from us or stop us from access. Let me give you an example. College admission, I did my BA in China. College admission in China is determined solely by once in a lifetime, three day tests in early July every year. Kids knows this equal expectation from day one of their grade one, regardless of social and economic backgrounds. So equity has increased awareness in the recent 10 to 15 years, I would say, because of, and it's, it's funny, because of after school enhancement programs, a paid service, to get you better prepared for the three-day tests. So who can afford those programs and for how long? Kids naturally don't have equal access to those opportunities. So it's an equity issue, but you know what? Because we're trained to value equality, people challenge themselves without asking for support. The current dilemma for parents and kids in Asian countries Families, rich or poor, support their kids wholeheartedly to provide equal access to those enhanced programs. Lots of life quality compromises and burdens. Kids, regardless of personal needs or desires of extra mentoring, basically, are enrolled in those programs and work so hard on academics plus trained talents, piano, dance, gymnastics, baseball, tennis, you name it. Hardworking, yes. Striving for success, yes. The right way or a right way to introduce equity? I don't think so. So going back to this question, challenges to equity in education, I think a more personalized holistic approach needs to be in place. Have you noticed that equity has been discussed in a very broad sense? How service providers address equity in kindergartens middle schools, colleges, workplaces is somewhat similar. That is equal access to opportunities. But if we really say that equity is all about custom tool, needed support, then a kindergartner's needed support should be different from a college student's needed support. Not just because of the age difference, but because as an individual, this person grows up and all previous support his or her growth. You may come up with very specific strategies to promote equality and equity to start with. School lottery systems, affordable housing, but it's not enough. There is an urgency of integrating equity throughout learning experience. Service providers need to provide support as needed from the beginning, starting from K, not by the time people apply for colleges and realize, oh, those groups need support, but the support is not in place. Being in higher ed for years, you may not be surprised with some selfish comments that college teachers complain about high schools, high schools complain about middle schools with regard to student readiness. 
<coughs> but what's very sad to me is that for us, it's just a complaint. But for students, they miss opportunities and years and years to grow with the needed support and be proud of their achievement, the equally high expectations. It's said that even with equal access later in their education, some students still cannot survive. Retention and progression rates are low. So why? why? Why students need to be vulnerable, struggling at risk to get the resources for them to be successful? We need a pathway to minimize achievement gap through continued support in education. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much for sharing, Ningzen. I'd love to hear a little bit more from our panelists. Bonita, would you like to contribute to this question? Yes, yes. I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to share my personal story um, because that's always been the thing that has driven me towards this topic. So in my experience, equity in education has played a very important role in my moving up the ladder. Um, I have spent my entire career working in the educational system via high school, community colleges, and universities. When I first started working at Fashion Institute of Design and Merchandising, which they call FINM, because I am from Los Angeles, California, my role was a financial aid coordinator. <laughs> I did not have any degrees at that time, and I quickly realized that those who had college degrees were given the opportunity to move into higher roles not necessarily higher paying roles. Back in the mid 1980s, and I am aging myself, it was all about perfect combination of work experience mixed with a college degree. Having the right connections also played a valuable role in moving into the next level positions as well. My transition to working at UCLA introduced a whole other world of what equity in education really looked like. No degree, baby on the way, and one very important connection allowed me to get my foot in the door and land my first UCLA position. My girlfriend who I worked with at FITM had transferred over to UCLA the year prior. She literally placed my resume on her manager's desk and put in a good word for me. So it worked because one month later I was hired. Yay. Multiple positions over the next nine years allowed me to gain computer software application experience, workplace administrative experience, and multiple connections that will serve me well through my upward and mobility in that workforce. The one thing that was missing, however, was still no college degree. Life continued to happen as my second child was born. My divorce was final and my mother had a massive heart attack. Through it all, I decided to enroll in college and begin my undergraduate program at the University of Phoenix. Two years later, or two years into the program rather, my mother was diagnosed with lung cancer and passed away three weeks later. I dropped out of school to be with my mom during her last weeks on earth, take care of family, business and spend more time with my small children at the time. Fast forward one year later, I re-enrolled and completed my undergraduate degree, graduate degree and certification in project management. I spent 17 years at UCLA and UC San Diego and never got past an administrative level position. I took my first job at Drew University after getting my bachelor's degree in business information technology as the program manager for the OBGYN department. I went on to get my second position at Hebrew Union College as an admissions coordinator with my master's degree in education. During that time, I also landed my first teaching job at University of Phoenix in the business division. So many challenges that I dealt with, with equity in the educational system in regards to career opportunities. How you choose to handle them helps to navigate and define your outcomes. I chose not to let those obstacles get in my way. I grew up under a different time 
when things could happen a little bit different just by networking. And that's not so much the, the thing that I see nowadays. You have to really put yourself in a position to table with those same people that are going up for that same position that you're going up for. As a black female woman born to a single parent in Los Angeles, California, I, all, I know all too well what you can experience if you allow it to get in your way. I grew up with a mother who said, no, you will never let a challenge get in your way. You will let an opportunity open that door for you. So in closing, I just wanna say that equity and education is always going to be there. It is never going to go away. I don't care if it's 10 years from now or 15 years from now, you will always have an experience in your life where someone's a little more qualified and someone may have come from a different background, but it doesn't mean that you can't be put on the same playing field with them at the end of the day. Knowledge is power, so take advantage. Thank you so much, Bonita. I'd love to hear also from Rachel. Holly, what I love about hearing these stories is that, it, is that I think it personalizes what we do as educators when we take an equity minded approach with students, with colleagues. This is the why behind it, right? We're all coming here with different experiences, different goals. Um, and I just thought it would also be helpful to highlight, this is why we have accommodations for students with disabilities, right? It's to inherently create equity or at least the hope for equity for students who we know are struggling in certain areas. And so when we think about why we put accommodations in place and we send, for example, you know, a student sends their authorized accommodations to a faculty member, I can tell you that those of us who work in access and wellness and disability support services often hear questions from faculty around, this is unfair. Why should this student receive more time than their peers? If I give Joe an extension, I should give everybody an extension. And I hear, I'm sure you've all heard questions like that or thought that yourself. And so to illuminate this a bit, we think about students with significant processing speed disorders, right? So we have a learning disability with a severe impact in processing speed. And I'm asking my class to take an exam and it's a timed exam. Now, if the goal is to figure out how fast can my students do this, well then no, extra time probably doesn't make sense. Though I could argue that, but I'll let that go for a second. <laughs> if what I'm trying to test my students on is their knowledge, their ability to synthesize information, their ability to connect the dots and make meaning from what they got from this course, then giving that student with a processing speed challenge actually gives them the ability to do that, provides them with access to the opportunity gives that student equity in this situation to be on a level playing field with their peers and demonstrate what they know. Think about a student who can't see. We're giving an exam and there are charts, tables on the exam, right? And as accessible and incredible as our classrooms are, when they work with adaptive technology, it just takes longer even if it's amazingly accessible. Okay, so when we think about tables, well, when I look at a table, I can see it and synthesize the information, right? If I'm a student who can't see and I'm using adaptive technology, do you know that what it does is read every single row, every single column, line by line, sort by sort, cell by cell. I don't know about you, but it would take me a lot longer to synthesize that information when it's coming in that way. So providing a student who's blind using adaptive technology with extra time isn't unfair. It is not equal, but it is certainly equitable. I hope Powerful. That Thank you so much for sharing. And I love that you guys are bringing in this, um, these real life examples for us here at Ashford. Um, so let's dive into Ashford a little bit more. What does equity look like in schools, in our community, here in an online learning environment? How does equity relate to access? Um, Rachel, I feel like you should kick us off. Well, the last part of your question, Holly, which is how does equity relate to access? I feel like I touched on a little bit. Um, but when I think about equity and access, I think about privilege. I think about allyship. Um, folks with privilege are usually in positions to advance equity, right? 
when we're talking about access, we're talking about a seat at the table. It's folks who have that seat at the table that can help bring others in, right? It reminds me of women earning the right to vote, white women specifically, but the women couldn't vote for themselves to earn the right to vote. Women marched, they protested, they did what they could do, but ultimately men had to vote for women to have the right to vote. And so the reason I use that example is that I feel like it helps illustrate that when we're talking about equity and access, it's about identifying privileges that we might have and how we can use those. So I, I make it my personal mission to do this as often as I can at Ashford in my community. One example um, that comes to mind for me is something that happens in our kiddos schools. So every year we get a lot of school forms home, lots of things to fill out. And still in 2020, some of those forms say dad's name, mom's name, dad's phone number, mom's phone number. I'm somebody who happens to actually fit in that model. I can fill out those boxes and turn that form in for my kiddos and wash my hands of that form. And yet every time I see that form, it makes me feel how little access and equity a simple form like that is providing to so many of my friends and my colleagues and my family. And because I have the privilege of actually being able to fill out those forms without blinking, I also feel like it's my responsibility <clears throat> to walk into that office and say, hey, have we thought about what we might be able to say differently on this form? I have a lot of ideas of what it could say, but I feel like for all the two mommy, two dad, single mama, grandma, auntie, foster care, all those different situations that don't fit into those boxes, those folks are out there fighting that battle too. But for me, I feel like it's my duty with my privilege to be able to offer those experiences and help bring folks to that table. So I like to think about, I guess I would charge folks to consider where you feel like you have privileges within your community, at Ashford, in your schools, and help identify where are places where you can use that privilege to offer access and equity and a seat to the table where folks might not have a seat and you do. Wow, thanks. Frank, I'd love to hear from you on this. Thank you, Rachel. I love that <clears throat> description. It's something that I, I talk about with my students as well. Um, I try to post something in, in the chat. Um, I don't know if it'll work or not, but as we look at images of equity and access, there's often discussion of a third space or even a fourth space going beyond equity, going beyond um, equality and looking at social justice. Some people sometimes refer to it as liberation. Um, and I wanted to kind of piggyback on Rachel's notion of having a seat at the table. So in the image that um, I kind of have in mind is <clears throat> where individuals are trying to watch a baseball game and in an equal world, they're all given the same box to try to look over the fence and watch the game. And obviously our, our little people, our, our young children, if they're standing on the same size box as an adult, they're never gonna be able to see the game. In a world of equity, a young child would be given two, three, four boxes so that they can raise their height enough to see over the fence and watch the game. But in this third space of liberation, social justice, whatever you want to call it, there's not a fence to be able to watch the game. You have the ability just to walk up and see the game, which I think is a wonderful image and powerful way to look at things. But even beyond that, one of the pieces that I would challenge us is in this imagery, the individuals are still the spectators to the game. And in many of the conversations, uh, the themes that are running around in this dialogue today, it's how do we get individuals from being spectators to the game of life, to the game of business, to the game of education, and to actually be the participants 
in the game. And so I would challenge us to be able to, you know, think beyond that equal access and issues of privilege and having a seat at the table to a vision of the world where all voices have impact to make decisions, that all experiences bring value to the perspective of the decision-making process. Um, I think many of us have shared how the privilege of gaining an education has enabled us to sit at tables and be in decision-making positions that our forebears may not have had. Um, and I know there was some dialogue in the chat too about being able to pay that forward um, as an alumnus of an institution, can we advocate for individuals who have similar life experiences as our own to mentor them into this world of education or business, whatever it might be. Um, and I think that's certainly part of the answer. Um, but I hope we can kind of envision a world where beyond the access question and challenge, uh, which I think started our conversation, we also are open to the notion and the ideal where everybody is an actor and a player in the game um, to be able to see all the beautiful things we can do when we work together rather than having spectators watching participants who rule the game. So thank you. Wow, thank you so much for sharing. And I really appreciate everyone who has contributed today. This has been such an excellent conversation. Um, it was just so meaningful and personal. And I, and I love that. I loved getting to know each of you so much more. Um, and I'd love to invite all of you to join us in our small groups, which we're gonna start at the top of the hour. Um, so that we can continue talking and we can get to hear your experience and your ideas and your thoughts on um, this important topic that, um, that we are so passionate about. So thank you so much for joining. Um, go ahead and take a passing break as Debbie calls it. And I will see everyone in a few minutes. Thank you.